All right, so hypothesis testing. So um, first we'll talk about what it is and what its purpose is, and then we'll learn how to do a, a basic one um, in terms of um, evaluating um, you know, some data set. So we'll cover the framework for hypothesis tests. We'll cover um, some different um, tests that are out there. We're obviously not going to cover all of them, but we'll, but they all generally follow the same framework. So, you know, once you're familiar with the, the framework and at least a couple of the basic tests, you can, you know, then expand your, expand your uh, repertoire, you know, to apply other tests that you might encounter. Um, talk about errors uh, in two types, um, two general types of errors that, that we can um, think about when we're doing hypothesis tests and how that relates to how we make um, decisions based on these kinds of tests. And then we'll wrap up with um, an overview of some of the uh, tests that are used to evaluate non-stationary. So formal definition here of hypothesis testing, it's just a um, method to make a statistical inference um, that helps us decide whether uh, the data we've observed supports a particular uh, belief about the population. So that belief we usually refer to as a, as a hypothesis, which is how hypothesis testing gets its name. Um, so two, two simple examples here. One is we might be um, trying to decide whether our data supports that regulation from some upstream dam has an appreciable effect on annual maximum flows at our downstream location, or um, as a non-stationary question, you know, we might ask whether or not temperature has been um, increasing over time. The framework for all hypotheses tests follow kind of these this basic outline and these steps. So the first thing we need to do is state a what's called a null hypothesis and an alternative hypothesis, which is generally the complement of the null hypothesis. We then have to have some data to test it. So generally we need to collect data in some way that will that is specifically designed to support our test of the hypothesis. So just because you have data doesn't guarantee that it's the right data or what it is you're testing. So that's an important step to make sure that your data supports what it is you're testing. And then you can perform one or more um, statistical tests on that data. Based on the results of those statistical tests, you then uh, have to make a decision on whether or not you're gonna um, accept or reject the null hypothesis. And, and normally the this is a little bit in the weeds, but the, the terminology, the formal terminology that he uses reject or not reject. And uh, I'll touch on the reason why that's the case a little bit later in the presentation. And then regardless of which outcome outcome we have, right, we, we always want to explore why we got that outcome. So that's generally referred to as attribution. So let's, so, so if we do have a test that suggests there's non-stationarity, we always want to then explore why that might be the case, right? Is it due to climate change? Is it due to, you know, land use changes? Is, is it due to something else? Um, because that also affects how we deal with it, um, say in a risk analysis. So again, the, the null hypothesis usually, but not always, um, we set it up in a way where the null hypothesis is a prediction that there's no relationship between the things we're interested in. Um, so again, the, the same examples we saw previously with flow and temperature. So our, our null, null hypothesis for those scenarios typically would be stated something like the distribution of annual maximum flow has not changed as a result of upstream regulation. So in other words, there's no relationship between upstream regulation and the flow at our site 
And then the second one there, temperature is not increasing over time. So there's no relationship between temperature and time. And then typically, again, but not always, um, the alternative hypothesis is a prediction that there is a relationship between those variables. So distribution of flow has changed or is impacted by upstream regulation and temperature is increasing over time. And then when we do hypothesis testing, our initial assumption is that the null hypothesis is the truth. So we assume that's the truth and then we test um, how likely it is based on our data that that is the case. So again, collect data that's representative um, and relevant to the test. So in this case, we might um, record observed flows before and after construction of upstream dams that may have affected, or that may have um, had a regulating effect on the downstream flows, and then observe temperature over time. Pretty, pretty straightforward there for that example. So when we're doing statistical tests, that's the next step. Um, what we're checking for is whether it's likely or unlikely. And again, you'll notice you'll never see anything being referenced as being a, a guarantee. Um, so it's either likely or unlikely that we would have observed the data that we did observe, given our initial assumption is true. So what we are testing with these tests is we're saying, is it is it likely or un unlikely that we would have seen what we have that we've seen what we saw in our data, given that whatever we've assumed is our null hypothesis is, is the truth? So if it's likely, if it's likely that that's the data we we would have expected to see, then we do not reject the null hypothesis. So again, notice we don't say accept; we say do not reject because accept maybe applies a little stronger belief that it's the truth, right? Again, it's not a guarantee. Um, and then if it's unlikely that we would have seen our data, say, well, if, if this was true, we probably wouldn't have seen um, the data. It wouldn't have looked like this, right? So if it's unlikely, then we, um, we reject the null hypothesis. Critical value is how we test whether it's, whether it's likely or unlikely. Um, so the way this works is a critical value is a generally a, a value that we compare to a test statistic. And we're answering the question of um, what are test, test statistic be more extreme than we would have expected if the null hypothesis is true. So the critical value tells us kind of what would what would we what should we expect, and then we do a test statistic, and if it's um, and we're checking whether it's more extreme or less extreme than we would than we would have expected to see based on that critical value. So if it's um, if it's if it's more extreme generally, then that means we reject the null hypothesis. If it's less extreme, then generally we do not reject it. So it's really it's really checking for is there um, is there a change or a difference in the data um, that would suggest that our um, null hypothesis is not true. Uh, and so when these changes happen, what this what these test statistics are essentially doing for us is saying um, there's different ways we could observe changes in the data, right? Um, and there's really two, two broad categories for this, right? One is it could just be random chance, right? It could just be that we have a, a period of time where we've collected data where um, we just had some, you know, some outliers in there or whatever it might be, right? So the change, you know, we, we think there's been a change, but it was just randomness, right? natural variability, or it could be because there actually is some underlying change in the physical process, right, that is changing um, our data. So again, that's what these tests are really checking for. It's, it's checking for that threshold between what's likely to just be random chance and what's likely to be due to some actual underlying difference. So the, the things we uh, things that feed into a statistical test, one is the significance level. 
um, alpha, which we've touched on already a little bit um, yesterday and earlier today um, in some of the lectures and with the exercise. So significance level alpha, you can think of it as being a, a measure of the probability of obtaining a type one error, and we'll define the two types of error here in the next slide. Typically, it's gonna be a small value, but it doesn't have to be. Um, and generally speaking, a smaller value for alpha means that you are requiring stronger evidence in order to reject the null hypothesis. So um, another way you can think of that is that a small value for alpha means if you're going to reject the null hypothesis, you want to be really sure, right? And alpha kind of is a measure of how sure do you want to be. And generally, you know, we want to be more sure than not. So generally alpha in practice is often a small value. 5% is, is 0 0.05 is the most commonly used value. Um, it's the most commonly used value because it's sort of been agreed upon as standard practice within the statistical world. Um, However, it's still just a, a rule of thumb. So it's there's no there's no um, there's no magical reason why alpha has to be five percent. Um, it's certainly a reasonable value, right? Because we want you know we want generally a high level of confidence before we reject the null hypothesis. But it's still um, an arbitrary number, right? Why why is it five percent? Why not ten percent? Why not something else? Um, and the reason it's so commonly used is because um, the author, Fisher, who's a famous stats person, um, who published this first, um, picked 5%, picked 1 in 20. Um, so you have to pick something. That's the number Fisher picked. And it's become, you know, the standard number. If he had picked a different number, if he'd picked 10%, then everybody would be using 10% today. So keep that in mind when you pick alpha um, and that, you know, although 5% is reasonable, there's no, you know, it's, there's no reason why it's the best possible choice, right? You, you may have reasons to pick a different value for your application, but 5% is pretty strong, right? So that, or pretty small. So that means you have to have pretty strong evidence or be, you know, very confident uh, that the data suggests rejecting the null hypothesis before you actually reject it. All right, so I mentioned the two types of errors. There's actually other types of errors, but we're just gonna talk about these two types here. So, um, because they directly relate to how hypothesis tests work. Um, so type one error, yeah, the formal definition of a type one error is that the null hypothesis gets rejected when it's actually true, when you, in other words, when you sh really shouldn't have re rejected it, right? So that's an error, right? If you reject it um, when you shouldn't have, uh, and they call that a type one error. So a simple example of a type one error would be that you test, you take a COVID test and you test positive for COVID, but it turns out you don't actually have it. It was, it was an incorrect test result. Um, in risk analysis, uh, the general example of a type one error would be that the, um, we estimate risk and we end up with a, um, a high, let's just say a relatively high risk estimate, but the actual risk is lower. And the, you know, the colloquial term for a type one error is a false positive, right? So it means you, you think the risk is high, but it's actually not high. So you have a false indication of, uh, you know, usually a false indication that there's a, a problem when there's actually not a problem. And then the other the other type of error is a type two error uh, when the null hypothesis is not rejected. Um, so you you don't reject it. In other words, you keep it, but it turns out you should have rejected it. Right? It, it's actually false. So again, just it's just the opposite of a type one error. So you test take a COVID test you test negative, but it turns out you actually have it because the test result was wrong. Again, in the risk analysis world, it would be an example where the risk estimate is low, but the actual risk is higher, so you've underestimated the risk. And we call that uh, usually a false negative um, type of error. So 
in um, well, let's let's look at this one here. So, so this is what that looks like in a little matrix, right? So the the left hand side is what you is the decision you make, and the top uh, or the columns is what's actually true. So the idea here is you have these two hypotheses, and if um, if the actual truth is the null hypothesis and your test doesn't reject it, that's good, right? You, you've resulted in the right decision. If the alternative hypothesis is true and you reject the null hypothesis, right? That means essentially those line up and you've made the correct decision. And then these are the two types of errors, right? So false positive is when the null is true, but you reject it. False negative is when the alternative is um, the alternative is true, but you don't reject the null, right? You you keep the null. So it basically means you've 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 adopted the wrong hypothesis, right? Based on the test result, you either get a type one false positive or a type two false negative. So example of how this comes into practice, at least informally, in in a lot of um, risk analysis applications, is it's very common practice. In, uh, in engineering as well, in engineering and in, um, in uh, risk analysis to try to um, avoid type two errors. So, you know, that's why in part, you know, that uh, that's analogous to, you know, in part why we have factors of safety in engineering and in risk analysis, why uh, particularly for screening levels of risk analysis, uh, if we're gonna if we're gonna um, err, we always want to err on the side of safety. So we we typically want to err on overestimating the risk rather than underestimating the risk. And again, especially at screening levels of assessment, as you get to more high, you know more detailed levels of risk assessment, um, you know that should diminish. And if you're doing a, a very detailed risk and risk analysis, you really shouldn't necessarily be erring. One way or the other, um, but in screen level where there's you know less information, lots of uncertainty, um, you know if you're if you're if there's if you're unsure about an input to a risk analysis, and there's a large uncertainty for screening, you want to err on the side of safety because it's better it's better to classify that project as having higher risk, sending it on to the next level of study, and finding out later that the risk may actually be lower than you thought. Um, that's a better outcome than if you um, if you have a type two or false negative error, where you underestimate the risk of screening. You leave a project in, say, a routine risk a routine program, and it turns out it's high risk, and at some point down the road it it fails, right? And you haven't been managing that risk because you thought it was low. So that's where it plays out in terms of actual decisions. Again, we don't, you know, we don't get in the weeds of type two type errors and all those things formally, but informally, this is how it how it's used in practice um, for risk informed decisions. All right. So speaking of decisions, so you have two decisions you can you can make um, based on your statistical test. You can either reject the null hypothesis or not reject it. So. The outcome of these, basically, if you reject the null hypothesis, you should then move forward as if the um, as if the null hypothesis. I'm sorry, as if the hypothesis is true. So you toss out the null hypothesis um, and you act as if the hypothesis is true. So in the example, going back to the upstream regulation of the temperature, if we were to reject the null hypothesis, then we should do any future work and decisions as if upstream regulation does have an effect on flow and as if temperature is in fact changing over time. And then failure to reject the null hypothesis is again the opposite of that. You behave as if the null hypothesis is true. So using the same example, if you don't reject it, then you should, um, let's say if you're doing a frequency analysis, you should do that analysis as if there's no upstream effect of regulation. And if you were doing some sort of analysis on the temperature, you should act as if temperature is not changing over time. And again, as I've mentioned several times, it's not definitive proof. Um, it's just a test to give us an indication on um, 
how we want to use our data going forward in terms of any analysis we're doing and any decisions we might be making. All right, so we'll cover non-stationary a little bit just because um, it's an important an important consideration these days for risk analysis. Um, the Corps of Engineers has an online free non-stationary detection tool. I don't have the link off the top of my head, but um, if you look it up, it's easy to find. So it does many, this, this isn't even a complete list. Um, it does many, many um, different statistical tests on data to check for changes over time. Um, the types of changes, it, this is a list of kind of the types of changes um, that you can check for. So you can look for changes in the typical value or the mean changes in the variability, uncertainty or variance, changes in the distribution. Um, you can look for changes that are happening um, smooth or gradual over time, you can look at abrupt. So an example abrupt, if you, you know, if you build an upstream dam um, that has a big effect on um, downstream flows due to regulation, right, you would see an abrupt change. If you have, you know, you know, may, maybe rainfall is um, gradually increasing over time due to climate change, right, that'd be a gradual change or do, you know, runoff changing due to land use. Um, oftentimes this will be gradual changes. Um, and then you can you can do an, uh, tests that are parametric, so based off of specific distributions. And there's also non-parametric tests, which um, are um, independent of any underlying distribution. And then you can also check for you know single point changes or multiple changes um, that might happen um, over time. Here's a li laundry list of some of the tests that are in there. We're not going to cover. Uh, most of these we're not going to cover, uh, but just to show you that there is there are many to choose from, and there's a whole manual that comes with the non-stationary detection tool that that gives you um, kind of each of these tests have different things they're testing for in different uh, in different ways for different reasons. So depending on you know what your application is, you know one or more of these tests might be more applicable to your situation. But you have to you have to do some some reading up on each of these tests to understand what each test is trying to test for and what it's trying to tell you about your data. A uh, couple of these we're going to touch on in the exercise. So I'm going to, uh, we're going to cover a couple of them in a little bit more detail. So if you're looking for um, testing for trends over time, here's three ways to do it. One is a man Kendall test. The other one is a Spearman's test and the other one is a send slope estimator. Um, so we'll cover we'll cover a couple examples here on a few of these tests. Um, so Kolmogorov Smirnov test, um, named after the people that came up with the test. Um, this is a way to compare two um, empirical distribution functions. So remember in previous exercises we calculated the empirical cumulative distribution function for an observed data set. So it's empirical, it's not tied to any specific parametric distribution. Uh, so in this example, we can talk about um, the regulation scenario where we might have observed flow measurements before and after upstream dams were built. And uh, we can compare them to see if there's a, a appreciable difference between those two sets of data. The other thing we can do is we can use it to compare um, empirical distribution from our uh, from our data to a theoretical distribution and use that as another way to test goodness of fit. So the null hypothesis, again, we assume there's no relationship usually to start. So we assume that the two data sets before and after regulation have the same distribution. The test statistic is the maximum difference between the two empirical um, distributions and the critical value uh, that we're checking that against is a function of the significance level we choose alpha and the sample sizes for the two data sets n and m and the formulas given there and then we want to reject the null hypothesis when our um, test statistic this d max is more extreme i.e greater than 
the um, critical value. So here's what that looks like in a simple, quick example. These are two um, empirical distributions of observed flows, pre and post dam construction. Um, generated the same way we've generated them in the exercises. And so here you need to choose an alpha. Again, we picked 5%. Um, the two sample sizes for these two data sets are 37 and 35. So we can plug those three values in the formula and get a um, critical value of 0.32. And then the D max, remember, which is our um, test statistic, is the maximum difference on the probability scale between these two cumulative distribution functions. So uh, if we look at, you know, across this, these two distributions, the largest difference happens here between, it, you know, whatever this value is, let's say it's, uh, I don't know, maybe 9,000 CFS or something like that. Uh, for the post-regulation case, we have a cumulative frequency of 0.86, and for the pre-regulation, it's 0.14. So the difference between those is 0.7. And so that gives us a value that's much larger than our um, critical value, right? So since the Dmax is greater than our critical value, we reject the null hypothesis, and we should treat these data sets as if they're different. And because, you know, and we might attribute that to upstream regulation due to construction of the, of the upstream dam. So what that means in practice is that we should not lump these two data sets together and fit them to a single distribution, right? Because they, this is, suggests that they, um, they are distinctly different, right? They're not independent and ident or they're specifically, they're not identically distributed. So what we would wanna do, we either need to evaluate them in some way separately, or we need to somehow um, maybe modify one of these data sets um, to account for the regulation, right? So we, uh, and that's common in hydrology, right? You can take um, data that's affected by regulation and in a sense unregulated, right? So that then the two data sets would be identically distributed and then you could fit the, the data to a, to a single distribution. Next test is the Spearman rank correlation for trends. So again, null hypothesis is no relationship, so no trend. In other words, no relationship between our variable and time. Test statistic is the Spearman rank correlation coefficient. So all this is, is we um, estimate the rank of our data, and then we calculate the Pearson correlation coefficient on the, on the rankings. So we talked a little bit about Pearson correlation coefficient yesterday. So in this case, rather than calculating the correlation of data values, we're calculating the correlation of the ranking of those data values. So you sort the data sets from smallest the largest or largest to smallest really doesn't matter just so they're sorted and then you calculate the um, uh, Pearson correlation coefficient off of the ranks of the of the sorted data sets and I get I guess to depend on how you um, yeah they do have to be sorted um, again the critical values come from various tables um, you can find in in lots of different publications so this is just one of one of many um, that you will find and again when the um when your test statistic r sub s which is the pearson um, rank correlation coefficient for your observed data is greater than the critical value you're going to reject the null hypothesis that there's no trend So here's a here's just a visual example of what that looks like with some some real numbers. I apologize, some of the numbers might be kind of small here. Uh, so this is precipitation um, data over a number of years. So here's the years in the first column, uh, the observed precipitation data in the third column. This is the same data used in exercise number two. You then um, rank the data. So in this case. Um, the years are already in order, so the rank is just 1 through 30. And then um, for the corresponding uh, precipitation for each year, you calculate what the rank of that 
uh, observed precipitation is over all the precipitation values. So this first year, 9.96 was, was the 10th tenth, um, tenth smallest, I think this the ranking is ascending here. So 10th smallest precip value. And 24.6 uh, down here in 2016 was the largest. So it gets the rank of 30. Um, you then calculate the correlation coefficient on these two rank columns. Um, and you, you can do it in Excel or any other any other software that has um, functionality to do correlation coefficients. So that's what this this first number is here. The correlation coefficient is 0.41. Uh, we choose an alpha value 0.05. Our number of data is 30. Critical value, again, this is one you have to look up in tables. Um, it's 0 0.306 for this particular case. And because our correlation coefficient, our test statistic for a data of 0.41 is greater than the critical value of 0 0.31, we reject the hypothesis. So we should, going forward, if we're going to analyze this data, we should treat the data as if there is a trend in it. And you can kind of uh, visually, maybe you can see you know, there's a little bit of an increase in trend here in the uh, in the data set. And then this is a, a different data set, but to show um, just the, the other result you can get, right? Same process, rank, years are already ranked, or already in order, so the ranking is just 1 through 30. And then um, the rank for the each of the observed values. Correlation coefficient here is only 0.1. Chose the same alpha, same number of data. So the critical value should be the same. And in this case, our test statistic is less than the critical value, so we do not reject. So in this case, we should treat this data set as if there's not a trend. And if you, again, visually, you might look at it and say, yeah, that doesn't, you know, visually, there's no obvious trend in that data. But um, the advantage of these types of statistical tests is sometimes visually, you know, trends or lack, lack thereof are not always um, obvious. So these test statistics just give us a more formal way than just our visual gut check, right, of actually formally um, having a consistent way to evaluate and report, um, you know, our analysis and decision as to whether or not we're going to treat this data as if it has a, has a trend. Okay, so first question um, was you were given um, three possible values for the significant level, and then the question was, which one is the best? So that was a trick question. So although 0.05 is the one that's most commonly used, um, that doesn't necessarily make it the best one, right? So all the values listed here um, could be good values to pick depending on your specific objective and application you know you might be you might have an application where you want an extremely high level of confidence before you reject the null hypothesis right so you know maybe there's applications where 0.01 is the you know the right number for your application and other cases where 0.1 is the right one uh, like I said, in, in the literature, you'll see 0.05 most commonly used. Um, but that doesn't necessarily make it the best for, for every application. So that was a little bit of a trick question. So the, the, the suggested answer for that one would be D. None, none of them are, are the best. One is not necessarily better than the other. All right, second question, statistical tests to prove. And again, the, the key word in this question, this was again a little bit of a trick question. Um, so sorry for that, but the key word in this is prove in the question. So remember, always remember that these statistical tests are not definitive proof, right? They don't guarantee that the outcome is true, right? It's only an indication of whether it's more likely or less likely to be true based on the data that you have. So for that reason, um, the suggested answer here would be false. Um, it, it will tell you whether or not you should accept or reject the null hypothesis and whether, you know, which one is more likely than the other, but it's not a proof of whether one or the other is, actual, is the actual truth. So that's, again, sorry, sorry for the trickiness in the question, but wanted to drive home that point that these are not a guarantee. 
Uh, number three, statistical tests tell us whether it's likely or unlikely. So this is this is the better way to phrase question two. Is the test statistical test tell us whether it's likely or unlikely that we would have seen the data that we saw, given that we're assuming that um, the null hypothesis is true. So that that one, the suggested answer there is true. So it looks like everyone got that one, pretty much. Um, so again, you know, remember that um, we're trying to decide is is what we're assuming, right? The null hypothesis is that is the data if if that were to be true, if that was reality, is it likely or unlikely that we would have seen the data that we saw, right? If it's likely, then we say, okay, we're gonna we're gonna uh, not reject it and treat it as if it's true. And if it's unlikely, we're going to say, well, we probably shouldn't have seen this data. So we're going to um, assume our null hypothesis is not true and reject it. All right, uh, number four. Number four was we reject the null hypothesis when the test statistic is greater than the critical value. The answer there is true. And you get to um, you got to see this in the examples in the in the uh, lecture and in in the exercise previous exercise when we looked at the Anderson Darling test. So again, this is just getting familiar with the, the weird terminology that statisticians use for this stuff. Is is that we have a test statistic, um, which is based on our data, the critical value, which says that giving the test. Um, Given, given the test, whatever the test is, right, it has a critical value. That critical value kind of sets the boundary between what what we would expect to see, right, and what we would not expect to see, right? That kind of sets sets that boundary line. So if our test statistic is greater, then that means, well, um, if our null hypothesis is true, we, we shouldn't have seen that data, right? So we reject it. And if it's less than that threshold, right, we say, well, that, that is what we should have seen, right? If our hypothesis is true, so we don't reject it. So again, it's, um, at least for me, it's always hard to keep that all straight. Um, it just, and honestly, I, I, to this day, I still can never keep it straight. I always have to have to look it up to remember how these statements have to be phrased so that they're correct. All right, number five, last question. So what's the best example of a type one error? Remember, uh, type one error is false positive, which, you know, the formal definition of that means we reject the null hypothesis incorrectly uh, when the null hypothesis is actually true. So uh, four examples here, um, and the best option there is A. So this is when our test says that Temperature is increasing over time, which means we would have rejected the null hypothesis. But in reality, um, temperature is actually not increasing over time. So we got an incorrect test result. And again, remember, if you reject the base, hypo base or null hypothesis, that's a false positive. Um, and then the other ones, um, the other ones there just give examples of different types of errors. So like, for example, C there says, uh, the test suggests temperature is increasing over time, but in reality, temperature is increasing over time. So that would be that would be in the OK box, right? So our test says we should reject the null and treat temperature as if it's increasing. And the reality is that it is actually increasing. So our test result matched reality. So that's a that's a thumbs up. And then on D, um, the test says it's not increasing over time, which means we don't reject the null hypothesis. But in reality, it's not increasing over time. So again, if there's a match, right, it's one way to think of it. So if the test says it's not increasing and the reality is that it's not increasing, that's a, that's a thumbs up as well. And then uh, B is, uh, is the test says it's not increasing, um, which means we would not reject the hypothesis, so we would treat it as if it's not increasing, but in reality, it is increasing. So that's the type two error. That's a false negative. False negative is when you um, do not reject the null hypothesis, but you should have, right? Because reality is that you should have. Um, so again, these, these, these are really tricky. The wording is, 
again, for me, not intuitive, but, but these are, these are the four outcomes you could have. So A is a type one error, uh, B is a type two error, and C and D um, would be um, no error. 